The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. When you're building a structure, the foundation that you build on determines the reliability of that structure, the longevity, how much weight that it can bear. So too with our lives, what we build our lives on, what's at the core of who we are, what we structure ourselves around, that determines uh, what we can take, what we can bear, what we're built upon, how long we can last. And we know in our hearts that the surest foundation that this world has to offer is Christ himself. Uh, Christ, who so many have rejected, has become the capstone, the cornerstone that holds the building together. So let us stand and sing his praises, for he is good, his love endures forever. Let's stand and sing from the gray hymnal, number 276, Christ is made the sure foundation. Number 276, Christ is made the sure foundation. Since the days of the apostles themselves, uh, the church has used uh, different sayings, communal sayings, poems, hymns, and things that we call creeds 
uh, to affirm together the beliefs of the faith. Um, all throughout the years, these creeds have served as uh, just powerful and valuable reminders of the things that hold us together, that bond us in unity, the beliefs that we share. In your bulletin today, on the back of your uh, worship order, you'll find one of the oldest and uh, most trusted and um, valued creeds of the church's history, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and we'll be reading the Apostles' Creed today just as an affirmation uh, of our faith together and the worship that we give to God this morning. Uh, so let us read together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from which he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Church, would you stand with us as we sing to God together? Come set your rule and your reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us.
darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win the nations back. Fill the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Amen. Bless God by clapping your hands to the Lord. God above, God above, all the world's in motion. God above, all my hopes and fears. And I don't care what the world throws at me now. Gonna be alright. such a pleasure worshiping with you all. Can you bow your heads and let's go to God in prayer. Lord Jesus, we just thank you that salvation is here in our midst, God, that you are here with us. And as we bring you praise, you inhabit the praises of your people. And Lord, I just thank you for your love. I thank you for your compassion, for your forgiveness, for your direction and guidance in our lives. And I thank you for this body of believers that comes together just to give you praise and to learn more about you, to know you intimately, and to seek after you. We give you all our praise. Amen. You all could be seated. 
So I want to take just a moment, if you're a first time guest, I want to point your attention to these connect cards that are right in front of you in the chair pockets. Um, if you would take just a minute and fill one of these out, this allows us to uh, get in touch with you and let you know more about the ministries of the church, um, as, as well as just uh, allow us to just have a record of your visit and know that you were, were here and worshiping with us this morning. You can either drop these in the offering plate as that comes by in a moment, or we also have some drop boxes that are located in the lobby um, on your way out. So if you take just a moment to do that. I want to go ahead and pray for our offering before we continue. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to give gifts. You've given the ultimate gift for us. And God, I just pray that the, from the overflow of what we have, Lord, uh, that we would give joyfully and that we would give uh, to honor you, Lord. And we give it all to you. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. You can find this in your Blue Pew Bible on page 1039. And this is Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 30. The rich ruler. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good, except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, no one has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Amen. And let's join together in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as we... Uh, Center our souls, focus our minds, and prepare to engage with God's word. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. What do you have a hard time letting go? I think all of us have had things in our past or in this season of life where we have a difficult time letting go. Maybe for some of us it's failure from the past. And that failure has defined us. It's like the tipping point of our lives. And we just can't let go that failure. For some of us, it might be guilt, even for uh, mistakes, sins of our past, that we know that we've sought Christ's forgiveness. We know they've been nailed to the cross, but we're still downloading, we're still playing that over and over and over, and we just can't let go of the guilt. Maybe for some of us, it's a dysfunctional or a damaging relationship, but it's comfortable and it's familiar, and it's just so hard to let go. Or maybe we're in a dating relationship and we know we're not honoring Christ, or maybe we are controlling another person and squelching them, and we just can't let go. For some of us, it might be about money or status that helps us, because of our insecurities, to feel important, but we recognize that it's beginning to shape us and There's a world filled with needs. And meanwhile, we're greedy because of our insecurities and we just can't let go. Or maybe for some of us, it's just the big picture spiritually. We just can't let go and trust God with our lives or to trust God with the next step in our journey. All of us have a challenging time letting go. Don't I have in different seasons of my life. Matter of fact, I think a big part of spiritual growth isn't when we say, hey, I've arrived, I kind of have it put together. We're probably farther away from God than we ever imagined in those seasons. It's when we recognize that we're on a lifelong journey of God teaching us to let go of things that God knows are damaging to us, are warping to us. They might be good things, but they're not the best things that God is calling us to. This morning's message is titled, The Guy Who Couldn't Let Go. We're in our People Jesus Met Summer Sermon Series. We're um, eavesdropping in on conversations that Jesus has with different people who Jesus meets throughout the summer. Today, the guy who couldn't let go, join me in Luke chapter 18 
and we're going to begin in verse 18. It's found in your blue Bibles on page 1039. So I want to ask everyone to find Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 18. Again, the blue Bible is page 139, or just look at the person next to you at their Bible. They don't mind. And um, that way all of us can follow along and eavesdrop in on this conversation Jesus has with a guy who couldn't let go. Luke 18, join me in verse 18. A certain ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Oh, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one's good except God alone. And you know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. It's amazing that this ruler says to Jesus, good teacher. And Jesus' response is kind of a zinger, isn't it? Because Jesus says, no one is good but God alone. I remember years and years, I mean, maybe 30 years ago, when I was a young Christ follower in college, and I first read this, I thought, is Jesus saying he's not God? Because only God is good, don't call me good. But that's not what's happening here. See, Jesus is helping to evoke what's really the heart challenge for this wealthy young ruler, whoever he is, whether he's a government official, he's part of the religious establishment, he's a successful business person. You see, this ruler, this, this person who Jesus encounters doesn't comprehend who Jesus is. He thinks well, maybe Jesus is a rabbi, maybe a prophet, maybe a teacher. All of those are human. And so what Jesus is helping him to understand is that don't think that anything people do is of the goodness of God. And that's really a theme of this passage. Because this ruler and what Jesus is evoking within him, his religion, he feels like he's earned. His status, he has achieved. And his wealth, he has accumulated. So basically, in a subtle way, while obeying God's law, he's really self Centered. It's all about himself and what he achieves, what he is able to accomplish. And Jesus' point is this, and don't miss this point, because this is really what uh, this conversation is all about. And that's that there's no human goodness, no human religiosity that measures to God's holiness. God is holy, pure, perfect. We can't even completely comprehend. Matter of fact, when God describes God's self, the, the, the primary term that links, that all of the other characteristics of God dangle off of, the center is the word holy. And holy, uh, which in the Hebrew text is kadosh, it's hagios in the Greek New Testament, it just means different. In other words, God attempting to describe God's self, the best that God can do is say, I am so different from you that you can't comprehend it. And then gives us human analogies about love, about compassion, about justice, about mercy, that we can understand in this world, in this fallen but beautiful world, that we recognize. So that's kind of a shadow, that's a blur of the perfect that God really is. And God is so holy that for us to somehow think, hey, in my religiosity, I've kind of impressed God. Because as soon as we do that, as soon as we think I've earned something with God, then I begin to think God owes me something, right? And I begin to be filled with pride. I've accomplished this, and you haven't, so I'm better than you. And we know what that has done in our world with religious wars and people holier than thou and a lot of damage to the, to the witness of Christ. Matter of fact, if we think somehow through religious observance we can reach God, then we're calling Christ a fool. Because why did Christ go to the cross and sacrifice his life if we don't need atonement that we can't earn? And I don't know about you, but I don't want to call Christ foolish for going to the cross. I want to be grateful that Christ has done on the cross what I could have never achieved myself, the redemption of my sins and the renewal of my life. Well, look at the response of this guy. Verse 21, all these things I have kept since I was a boy, he said. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, oh, but you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. It's fascinating because uh, when Jesus lists five of the commandments, 
I, I, I think Jesus is purposely doing this. They are the five that are the more horizontal. They are about human relationships. Okay, he's saving the vertical about our heart for God to later, right? But these are all about our relationships with people. And so this guy is saying, look, I've kept the law of God. I have outwardly been devoutly righteous, and that's turned him into being self-righteous, and that means he really doesn't need God. Think about it. See, if we're purely religious, and we think I am on this journey attempting somehow to reach God or appease God, it means God is kind of remotely watching and saying, are you going to make it in your life? But God loves us more than that kind of parenting, right? See, God is not watching us. God is more concerned about shaping us. And that means active trust and involvement in God's spirit shaping us, teaching us, encouraging us, convicting us of our sin. That's a lot more scary, isn't it? Because that's a trust relationship. See, I can be very religious at a distance from God and go through the motions and never, and basically be almost like a Christian atheist. Where I do the Christian stuff, but in my heart, I've supplanted God somewhere way off to the peripheral of my life. Does that make sense? See, that's when we're farthest away from God. And God is more concerned about when we're grateful recipients of grace of what Christ has earned for us on the cross, for us to be humble recipients of grace and then ask, God, would you take me on a journey and shape me more like you? So, I might, so my life might be like a fragrant aroma to you and so that people might see more of who you are as I'm shaped more like Christ. Amen? It's a whole different uh, approach, mindset, worldview. Now, what about what Jesus says about sell everything you have, give it away, and come follow me? Here's the question. Is that a universal command? I know all of you are waiting to think, oh, I hope not, right? Well, the truth is it's not a universal command. Okay? So, so don't sweat it. But probably even more challenging, right? There is a, a, a timeless universal teaching principle behind this. And that is that, you know, to this specific guy, pride of accomplishment, holding on tight to his stuff, captivated his heart, shaped his life, and that's what Jesus knew. He needed to drill down deep because that was the issue that was at the heart of this guy really being distant from God. And so, in our specific lives, what would Jesus say to us? See, our Heavenly Father's parenting isn't one size fits all. Right? Good parents understand uniquely each of their children. Right? A good teacher understands the unique children in that classroom. And so God understands uniquely each of us and knows. And so the questions might be, are you really at a safe distance from God going through human religiosity? You know, going through those motions, doing Christian stuff, but really God is at a safe distance. And God's heart is broken, longing for us to be in an intimate trust relationship where we're more shaped like Christ. Or are we humble recipients of grace? We say, God, I, I can't impress you, right? You're holy, you're God. Instead, we take my sin and we nail it to the cross. My sin, my filth, my brokenness, my depravity. And God, in response, now that we're in a covenant relationship, will you parent me? Will you walk alongside me? Will you... Will you mentor me? Will you shape me? Will you even convict me of sin because you love me so much? And then the question when Jesus would look into our eyes, what is it that we're holding on to that's between God and us? It might be a horrific sin. It might be a good thing in the eyes of the world. But God knows that's, that's become an idol. That's what's be between God and us, and it's going to warp our lives because we become shaped like the idols of our lives. Whatever we worship shapes us. Just one question before we move on. Why is Jesus so demanding with this guy, right? Give away everything you have and come follow me. I really believe that this is an intervention with this guy. Have you ever been part of an intervention? I have before, and, and where, where someone we know, we love, I have with, with a family member. 
uh, distant family member, so, or someone we love and we know that, that they're warping their lives, that they're, that they're damaging their lives, that they're hurting people who they love. And, and so we, we intervene and we lovingly confront them with kind of a pathway for them to, to take, to move toward healing and transformation. It's, it's one of the most challenging but loving acts that we can ever do. This is an intervention because this guy is under the influence of idols. He's under the influence of something in his heart that's more important than God. He's become intoxicated by the world. He's still obeying God's law externally, outwardly, but his heart is far away from God. Do we need an intervention from God? Will we be open to talk about it? That this will be, as we say so often, the safest place on earth. For us to talk to guess, you know, this is what I'm wrestling with. This is my idol. This is my temptation. This is, this is the sin that I've fallen into. This is the guilt that I can't shake from my past. I know it's been nailed to, to the cross. And will we look at each other like, oh, you, you, you've done that? Or will we lean in and love each other and walk on the journey of helping each other to let go of whatever it is that God's calling us to let go? I want to say I've had people like that in my life. I have people right now like that, uh, primarily men, in my life. And it's tough. Sometimes I find myself, honestly, you know, you know in the morning, like, oh, I could sure make this a busy day and kind of call out. You know what I mean? And I feel like that sometimes. And it's amazing how many times with primarily five guys and then a community of pastors who will get together, we'll sit across the table, and we'll both say, oh, yeah, I was, like, trying to find a way to, to avoid this. Oh, me too, you know. Because it's challenging, isn't it, to lean in, to really trust, and to really hear, to have the intervention of our soul. Well, look at verse 23. Here's, here's this guy's response. When Jesus lovingly but directly uh, intervenes, attempts to intervene into his life, when, when he, the rich young ruler, heard this, he became very sad because he was really wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone to enter the kingdom of God. Here's what's tragic about this. From this guy who couldn't let go, there's no questions. There's no dialogue with Jesus. There's no wrestling through it. He just gives up and walks away. You know, you know most of us have some kind of avoidance uh, Challenges in our lives, right? I love to avoid conflict, right? I'm learning to lean in, not be passive-aggressive with conflict. And this guy, just, it's too much and he walks. How tragic. Because I want to remind us, when God's Spirit convicts us, it can be scary, our heart can start to race. Remember this, God's motive is, is never to damage us. God's motive is never to say, aha, <laughs> I got you. God's motive is always because God wants to shape us and pour out his grace and change us to be more like Christ. It's always God's motive in convicting us. Instead, he couldn't let go. No wrestling, no dialogue. He just walks away sad. In his classic book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes these words. The difference between ourselves and the rich ruler is that in Jesus' presence, he was not allowed to solace his greed by saying, never mind what Jesus says. I can hold on to my riches detached from my faith. God has forgiven my sins, so I have fellowship with God, and I can live how I want. Isn't it easy for us when Jesus might feel at a safe distance as we're religious for us to do what Bonhoeffer describes as have things of life detached from our faith. You know, where we compartmentalize our faith. Here's my faith at church or home, or in my, but then here's when I go to work and they're completely detached. And here's when I'm out on a date, completely detached. And here's when I'm with my family. Here's my finances, whatever they might, and they're detached from the compartment of faith. 
That's what Bonhoeffer's drawing out. That's when we cheapen grace. And that's when there will be those issues in our lives in sealed compartments that God's Spirit will need to have an intervention to draw out of us. Rather than us on the lifelong journey of learning to have faith not detached, but surround and infuse every area of, of our lives. Here's the challenge. Is Christ at the center or is Christ invited in my family? Is Christ invited in that dating relationship that I'm in? Is Christ invited in my work ethics? Is Christ invited uh, when I'm on my dorm floor with my friends? Do we compartmentalize? Do we detach our faith? And, and then Jesus says this, this fascinating image uh, about a camel going through the eye of a needle. I, just a sidebar comment that I can't help. We've probably heard in sermons before. Matter of fact, let me ask you, how many of you have heard in sermons before that there was the camel gate at Jerusalem and, and so when, when uh, evening came, the gate was closed, but the small camel gate was still open, so the camels could, could wiggle through and come in. How many of us have heard that in a sermon? All right. I want the name of that pastor who preached that sermon. Okay. No. <laughs> because the first sighting of that is from the ninth century in a sermon from someone who'd never been to Jerusalem before. There was no camel gate. All right. We've had enough gates. You know, we, we've had Watergate, you know, but, but this is Camelgate, all right? Here's why. If that's true, what it means is we can still earn our way. If we just squeeze hard enough, we can get through the gate to the kingdom of God in our own effort. Does that make sense? See, Jesus is really saying this. Let's remember good biblical interpretation is from the ears of the audience who's reading or who's hearing it. And in Jesus' generation, uh, uh, the biggest animal that was uh, everyday life, right, in the ancient Near East was the camel. And the smallest task, especially before people had reading glasses, right, or LASIK surgery, was what? Threading a needle. And so Jesus is basically taking what people thought of as the biggest and what in people's everyday experience was the smallest. And he says, for those who are rich. Now, let's define this. He's not simply talking about wealth, although for some of us that might be the issue. When we feel I'm wealthy in what I've accumulated, in what I've achieved, and we hold on to that, and that, our, our insecurity, those things become God for us. They become idols, all right? There is no way that we can really enter or live in at peace with God, the kingdom of God. Because living in the kingdom of God is when we empty ourselves. We say, God, thank you that you created me and, and, and the beauty of your creation, but God, the image of God, the imago Dei has been damaged, tarnished, depraved, and I confess to you that I can never enter through the gate in my own effort. But God, Thank you that, that like a camel passing through the eye of a needle, what's impossible that I could never earn or achieve from you, you have opened the gates because of what Christ has done on the cross that opens the camel gate, that opens the doors to the kingdom of God wide open for us. Does that connect? It's powerful what Jesus is saying when we understand the context. Well, in verse 26 the crowd responds, and then we'll finish in verse 28 where the disciples respond. So first the crowds say, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, what's impossible with people is possible with God. See, the crowds are really asking, who could ever be religious enough to obey the whole law of God and give away everything? There's no way anybody could be that religious. And what this is evoking is, when we are religious, meaning God is at a distance, he's given us laws, if we obey those laws, we earn our way, we impress God, we, we make it through the gates on our own effort of the kingdom of God. Our life will be filled with stress. We'll, we'll be like the crowd, man, who can, who can do it? Who can obey all of God's law? Who can be that generous? Who can be that sacrificial like Christ? 
And because of that, we'll lay in bed at night and we'll worry. Oh, God. Or we'll dumb God down. We'll say, well, you know, God's kind of like the, um, the pantheon of the Greek gods. And we'll dumb God down to be kind of like us so we can reach God. And let me tell you something. If God is at all equivalent to me, we need to go shopping for a different God. Okay? Right? Because God is holy and pure and love and justice and will never deny his character. But Christ on the cross has taken that justice that we deserved, put it upon Christ, and opened the floodgates into the kingdom of heaven. Amen? That's what we're celebrating together. And so the question now that the apostles asked, wrap, wrapping it all up, is it worth it to let go of what is so difficult to release? Verse 28, Peter, thank God for Peter, who's always ready to ask the questions. Peter said to him, we've left all we had to follow you. And so Jesus, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. See, the apostles are freaked out. They're like, whoa, Jesus, you've never laid down the gauntlet of this standard before. We need to obey the whole law, and we need to be ready to whatever it is in our lives, let it go, release, trust it to God, who, by the way, so often entrusts back to us more than what we ever sacrificed. But, and so what they're saying is, we've sacrificed so much, Jesus. We've let go of so much. Has it been worth it? Will we pass the test? And what Jesus is saying to his followers or whatever sacrifices we might make in this world, not to reach God, not to get to God, not to appease God, but in response to what Christ has done on the cross, whatever we might sacrifice in this world, whatever we might let, let go of, the rate of return on that investment is beyond anything we could ever find in this world. So will we hold on for a brief time called human existence? Or will we let go? of whatever it is that God's Spirit says, I love you too much to let that shape your life. I love you too much for you to be abused in that relationship. I love you too much for you to warp my witness like that. I love you too much to have your character shaped in a way that will be so damaging and wants to shape our character as we let go of those things. When God has an intervention, in our lives. It's worth it. Amen? When we really realize God will shape us in this life, oh, and in eternity the rate of return is beyond what we could have imagined. I think it's one thing to preach a message, sing a song, and say amen, and then we go on our way. But just something to help us to kind of experience this. I, I just want to invite us to stand up. Okay? I'm not going to make us dance or do anything, so don't worry about it. If you just stand up, will you raise your hands? And close your fist. And, and you can just gently close it or clench it closed tightly on this prayer journey. What is it? Oh God, by your spirit will you reveal to each of us. Will you drill down deep? What is it that we're holding on to? God, maybe it's guilt and shame of things that you've nailed to the cross that we are forgiven but we just can't forgive ourselves and we need to release and let go. Father, maybe it's that secret sin that only we know about and you know about, but we make up every morning wondering, is today the day I'm going to be found out? And we know that that secret sin is warping our character. Maybe it's a relationship that's either damaging to us or we're damaging someone we need to let go of that controlling behavior or that abuse or maybe even of that relationship. Father, maybe it's out of our insecurities that we're greedy. We don't really feel like it because we live in, in a culture that uh, thrives on greed. But God, you know that we're greedy. And because we're holding on to stuff and because we'll do anything to make more money that because of that, it's shaping us around those things and, and there's a world filled with needs. But God, maybe we're just holding on to our life so close. We're doing religious stuff, but we've never really given over to you. 
God, whatever it is right now that your Holy Spirit is shining a light of conviction on because you love us, now we just open our hands in a posture of letting go. And as we let go, our arms are raised, O oh God, in praise to you, who even though we have wandered astray from you, even though we have violated your covenants, even though, God, we have broken your heart, even though there's depravity deep in our hearts, your grace has been poured out on the cross where you've taken all of that, you've taken the, the judgment, the justice of God upon yourself in our place. And so we're set free to be your children, to be shaped more like you. So our hands are now open in a posture of praise and glory and honor to you. Father, will you guide us? May this not just be a Sunday morning message and we go on our way. We invite your Holy Spirit to cheer us on as we're learning to trust you, to affirm that we are your children. But then also, God, we invite your Spirit to convict us. We won't be afraid. We won't run. We won't walk away sad like this rich young ruler, but we'll lean in. We'll ask the hard questions. We'll wrestle to discern how your Spirit is shaping us to let go. Praise, glory, and honor be to you, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need you. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 379 in the gray hymnal. Take my life and let it be. Let's make this not just words we sing, but let's make this our hearts cry, our prayer, as we sing together.
reminder that our Maker Fun Factory uh, summer camp, Vacation Bible School, is less than a month away. It's a great outreach uh, to reach children and families in our community. In your bulletin is a form that is designed for us to invite family, friends. What a non-threatening way to invite someone. The worst will say is, no, we're not interested in that camp. But if they come then those children, maybe for the first time, will experience God's love and hear the gospel. And it's amazing how many parents will come to the closing each day and they'll say, I never knew church could be like this, and uh, enter into community. Uh, if you're interested in volunteering, too, stop by the table, sign up. So many different ways to volunteer. Did you notice the most significant contrast in the conversation in the passage that we study? The rich ruler walked away sad because he couldn't let go. The other rich ruler, Jesus, let go. And by letting go of the glory, the honor, the wealth of heaven, by letting go of his life, he didn't go away sad. But he brought to us the joy of our salvation. May we be a people who cling close to God and are ready to let go of whatever it is that God calls us to then be shaped more like Christ. Glory and honor be to our God who shepherds us on the journey. Amen. Have a great week.